I grew up in uh, what I would call a Chabad rabbinic family, okay? The uh, Wall Street Journal did an article on my extended family and uh, referred to us as the largest rabbinic family in America. Now, I don't know if that's fake news or real news, but it, it sets the stage for my upbringing. And when you grow up in such a family, community work is very much admired. And therefore, charity and raising money and giving money, talking about it all the time, was a huge theme for us. And we were taught charity in basically two levels. Level one is how most of us probably understand tzedakah as this act of kindness, okay? This act of gamilat chasadim, right? And Maimonides says, what is charity? If, if a poor person puts out his hand, you should put, give him a dollar. Now, you can do this mitzvah once a day. You could do it once in your lifetime, and you have fulfilled this mitzvah of essentially kindness. But there's a, another level, a more, let's call it, idealistic level. And this is maisa, tithing, giving 10% of your earning. And this is a much more measurable, quantitative um, way to give to charity. And it's essentially God saying to us, listen, for every dollar that I'm going to give to you in your lifetime, 90 cents of this dollar is yours to keep and to spend, and 10 cents of this dollar is yours to give away. Now, you can keep it, but if you do give it away, you're joining God in this partnership of making a better world. In addition to this incredible duty and responsibility and partnering, partnering with God, he also really lays on the benefits and rewards of this partnership and what the ROI is going to be. And he goes so far as to say in the Talmud, test me in this mitzvah and I will make you wealthy. Now, God doesn't do that with a lot of mitzvahs. He doesn't say, uh, you know, turn your phone off on the weekends and I'll make you rich. He doesn't say, don't take this piece of American cheese and put it on this burger and, and, I'll, and I'll make you rich. He's very clear when it comes to tzedakah and tithing that he will really go all in and test him. Okay? So for me, this was very exciting growing up. And here was my plan. It was a very simple plan. Give to charity. Change the world. Get rich. Game over. Right? Wrong. Because what they didn't tell me was how hard it would actually be. What they didn't tell me was that before you have a chance to give 10%, 20% has to go to rent, and another 20% has to go to tuition, another 10% has to go to national grid, and another 5% has to go to food, and to clothing, and to the leak, and on and on and on and on. So, change the world. I didn't have enough funds to change my kids' diapers. So for a large chunk, for a large chunk of my 20s, I didn't give to charity at all. I'm hoping that none of you read my bio. I uh, consult nonprofits how to raise funds. So if you guys can just please, we'll edit this one out. And then one day everything changed. Three years ago, a close friend of mine, Nadiv, who was 30 years old, he passed away. And Nadiv was survived by his wife and four beautiful children. Nadiv had a heart condition, so he was unable to get life insurance. So right away, a bunch of our friends got together and we said we need to put together some type of campaign, a crowdfunding campaign for the family. What we originally intended to be a hundred, maybe two hundred thousand dollar campaign if we can get the entire community to give and help the family out for a year or two, before the end of the week there was over a million dollars raised from 5,678 individuals. Now I'm sure some of you have been a part of crowdfunding, whether it be for an organization, 
whether it be for someone who had a medical condition or maybe your younger sister decided she needed to send her cat away on a vacation to Spain for three months so she needed to do a crowdfunding. There's a lot of those out there. Uh, beware. Um, and I also have uh, experienced crowdfunding in, in, in my work, but this was the very first time that I experienced it for something personal. And the very first thing that I noticed, something very shocking, was who the heck are all these people who are giving to this campaign? See, Nadiv was a very popular person. Anybody who knew him, he had the heart of gold. He was an incredible person. But he didn't know five and a half thousand people. Nobody knows five and a half thousand people. So the first thing that I wanted to understand is what compelled these complete strangers to participate in a campaign for a family that they've never met? Now, the answer to that question came to me in the form of a mystical dream with a burning bush. I'm just kidding. It was a Facebook post. <laughs> <laughs> but like all great knowledge today, uh, most of it comes through on Facebook posts. And this Facebook post of someone sharing the campaign while it was going on it has completely shaped and changed my understanding of the power of charity, and my contribution. And he wrote as follows. I never met Nadiv or his family, but I've been watching the campaign. And from seeing how many hundreds of people are participating, $5, $10, $15, and how many people are sharing it, and how the media is picking it up, and how many, I want to be a part of this, he wrote. And those words were ringing through my ears. I want to be a part of this. What was this? This is the best way I can describe it is one word. Togetherness. Togetherness. You see, my understanding of tzedakah was very two-dimensional until that moment. You know, in the left corner, you have kindness, right? Level one. But what if I'm not feeling particularly kind? What's motivating me to participate in this mitzvah? What's motivating me to help? You know, I look at a guy on, a, on, on the street who's asking for funds. I'm thinking about all the drugs he's doing and how he's mismanaging the funds, right? So, and in the right corner, you have tithing. So maybe I am the kindest person on the planet, but I don't have the means to give to this person, right? And it's not about the difference between putting away money for a college fund, right, versus, give, versus tithing. You're talking about someone who didn't, who was living check to check. What does that person do, and how does that person participate in the mitzvah? So you're kind of doomed when you look at it in this, in this two-dimensional way. But when you include this ingredient of togetherness, something magical happens. Two new motivating factors come to the surface. The first one is a sense of belonging. When brothers and sisters come together to help a family in need, their father died. And they knew that if they gave $15, they felt this sense of togetherness that everyone in the community, complete strangers, can help this family. And anybody, given the chance to feel a sense of belonging, you don't have to force them. It's an innate feeling, emotion, that we're always looking for. The second is a sense of impact. When these people participated in this campaign, they knew that with 15 bucks, with 10 bucks, they'd be able to actually help this family because a little bit from a lot of people really adds up to a significant amount. Include togetherness, and you get two emotions that are always there. And anybody, anytime, given the chance to get these emotions, they will do it. I couldn't have been the first person to discover this, right? Um, I'm a big believer, as King Solomon says, ain't nothing new under, under, the, under the sun. If it's happening, it's happened in, in the past. So I figured there must be some kind of biblical precedence for this element of togetherness. And I went on a discovery to figure out if there is a biblical precedence for people-powered charity. 
So what does one do when they want to find the biblical precedence or historical Jewish precedence for something? They open a Gemara, they open up a Chumash. But when you come from the largest rabbinic family in America, you just call your rabbi brother Marty. That's his real name. And, <laughs> and I called up my brother Morty, and my brother Morty, just to describe him, he's a vastly more learned, slightly less handsome version of myself. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I told Morty what happened, and I said, Morty, is there, uh, is, I told him, is there a historical precedence in the Torah for people-powered charity? And he thought for a moment, and he said, well, actually, the Mishkan. The Mishkan was the mobile temple for the Jewish people traveling in the desert. It was the first capital campaign in, historic, in history. And when God wanted to uh, raise the funds for this capital campaign, he could have went to, to a few top dogs, you know, went to his local federation, maybe get a few people right to come together. But instead what he did was something very interesting. He went to the enti entire Jewish people, every single Jewish family. And he said, I want you guys to give what we know as machzis hashekel, a half a shekel. Today, the a half a shekel would be the equivalent of about $15. And every single family participated. But why did they participate? You know, it wouldn't be the first or last time that the Jewish people didn't listen to God when he asked them to do something, right? So there must have been something there that the, every single one of them participated in. You know what it was? People power charity. In the first moment when God asked for their $15, I think, what's this $15 going to do for this multi-million dollar project? But then right away they thought, wait a second. If everybody's giving, if God cc the entire Jewish people on, the, on, this, on, this, on this email, and that means that my neighbor is giving, my neighbor, neighbor's neighbor's giving. So they right away, instantly, they felt like, wow, number one, it feels good to be a part of something. This is going to be a temporary dwelling place, a temporary temple for the Jewish people. We're all going to be able to go and pray and congregate and sing and sacrifice. They felt this amazing feeling of belonging, of community. And they felt a sense of impact. They said, heck. With 15 bucks, I'm going to get this million, multi-million dollar project built. So I look back on my friend's campaign, on Adiv's campaign, it was a campaign of biblical proportions. You know, we didn't have the access that God did, you know, to the entire Jewish people, but we had something else. We had Facebook, and we had something else. We live in a hyper-connected world. That if you want to get the message out about something, you need to have a good cause, you've got to be organized, but you can get the word out. Now, at this point, I got good news and I got bad news. The bad news is that I know, and probably some of you are thinking of this, yeah, sure, a little bit from a lot of people, it comes together, it adds up to a lot, but how much does it actually add up to? How significant is that really? because the majority of the world's wealth is in the deep pockets of the wealthy, okay? And when it comes to solving real issues of our time and seeing the end of slavery in our time, the end of hunger in our time, seeing that every single person gets an education in our time, a little bit from a lot of people is not gonna cut it. We need the 1% to come forward and put up the mega wealth of the world to really solve real issues. But I got good news. And the good news is that I failed to mention the end of both of these stories. The moment the Mishkan was built and everyone participated with half a shekel, God came out and he made a second ask. You know what that second ask was? My sir, 10%. And thousands of Jews participated in my sir. And there were a lot of wealthy Jews. People came out of Egypt with a lot of wealth. And people had a lot of land. They had to go into their land and they had to go and they take the miser and give it and, and give it to God. But they did. Now, why did they give? When a wealthy person is thinking about whether they're going to separate with their hard-earned funds, there's usually one question that's on their mind. Who else is giving? They want to know who else is giving 
because they need the need to be qualified if they're going to put their money into this project. They need to know that the community wants this, the community needs this, the people who are raising the funds are going to spend the funds wisely, and their money is not going to go be thrown away into some black hole. They didn't need to ask, because they knew already that every single Jewish person and every single Jewish family already participated in the Mishkan. We want the Mishkan. So when God asked for funds to furnish the Mishkan and to bring sacrifices to, 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 to the Mishkan, they gave freely. Something very similar happened in my friend's campaign. What I failed to tell you was that from this million dollars, only half of it was raised from five and a half thousand people. The other $500,000 was raised from less than 10 people. People who gave 10, 20, 30, and there was even an individual who gave $50,000 to this campaign. A person who gave $50,000 never met Nadev. But after seeing how much the community want this to happen and seeing thousands of people living check to check, giving $15. You know, $15 is the difference between buying three bags of diapers, FYI, okay? And taking this $15 and giving it to this cause, for a lot of people, it's not easy. So when they saw that happen, they saw this must be an important cause. They felt this sense of belonging. They wanted to be a part of this. But more importantly, they felt a sense of impact. And I'll tell you why. It wasn't a $50,000 campaign to help the family for two months. They saw this campaign growing, 100,000, 100,000, 100,000, but in such a short period of time, they thought to themselves, well, if I give to this campaign, this may actually be a real solution and cushion for this family for decades. And they said to themselves, this is a cause that I want to participate. It was the collective kindness, but more importantly, the collective intelligence that inspired them to separate with their friends. What I've come to learn through my experience in crowdfunding is really how God intended charity to be from the outset, from that first capital campaign. And when we include this ingredient of togetherness and we find ways to give together, and we can do so much today with the power of the hyper-connected world that we live in, we can not only make a significant impact in our lives and in our community, we can actually be a part of changing the world because our $15 is the starting point. It's the trigger point. It's the motivating factor. It is the guide to the mega wealthy to say, yes, this is an important cause. This is something that you should give to. This is something that people want. And the more we do give our $15 consistently, the more we are going to increase the wealth of the world. So does my charity matter? My small, modest amount? Does every one of us in here, the little bit that we, that we can give every single day, does it matter? I literally can't see how charity could happen in any meaningful way without us. So I will leave you with this thought. Now that hopefully you are convinced about the power of your modest contribution, what Mishkan will you begin to build today?